Hello everyone, welcome to HR Katha Presents Happiness at Work, powered by happiness.me. Happiness.me is a global community of experts empowering organizations to create a happier work culture. Every month, we speak to a few organization leaders on how they perceive happiness and how employee happiness contributes to their business. Today, we have a very senior HR professional, Jacob Jacob, who is currently the group CHRO at Malabar Group, which is into the gems and jewelry business. Jacob comes with a wide experience, having worked both in India, Dubai, and Malaysia. In his previous role, he was the group CHRO of the hospital chain, Columbia Asia. Malabar Group has around 15,000 employees across the world. It is a very unconventional set of employees, so it will be interesting to discuss with Jacob what does what he does to keep his employees a happy lot. Welcome to the show, Jacob. Thank you. So I think uh, it's a very relevant, relevant topic that you have, and thank you for the introduction. And I think uh, today happiness at work is very much at the forefront of most CEOs and uh, the HR uh, heads of the organization. Given that so many things have changed, you know, post COVID and during COVID, there's been a whole lot of turmoil. There's been a whole lot of issues on mental health, on employee yeah. well-being. And at the end of the day, now you know it comes back to the basic fact that how you've taken care of your employees during this time is during what is, is is their time to repay back in terms of what you've done. So those organizations which really have taken some draconian measures will obviously will never be in the lead as far as the employee practices are concerned. But those who've had the commitment and resilience to ensure that, you know, safety of their employees, caring for their employees are the ones who will make that difference in terms of the threshold level of enterprise growth. Okay, great. Uh, so tell me, you know, uh, Malabar group I was talking about, you, you have a very unconventional set of employees and, you know, you have also worked across organizations, you know, you might have found very different set of employees there and be, you, because Malabar group is into gems and jewelry business, it will have a very different set of employees. Are the nuances of happiness any different? Please understand that, you know, for in the gems and jewelry business, majority of the manufacturing of gold, which happens in the yeah. factories are done by carriers or smiths, yeah. you know. And Smiths, you know, they're mainly from West Bengal yeah. and uh, a very, you know, not very educated, but they're extremely skilled in terms of uh, you know, yeah. design, putting together various, you know, various jewelry patterns which are needed at the retail store or what they do. Yeah. At the retail store, majority of the staff are, you know, majority of the staff are, uh, you know, retail staff, sales staff, who either graduation or, you know, uh, basic yeah. graduates who come and, you know, they want to get into a sales job. And it's very different in terms terms of the profile of the kind of work that they do it's basically a lot around experience and knowing the product of course that is generically said that you know a salesman has to know the product and you know and and how it is generally uh, that i put it across but i think the biggest differentiator that what you know for this workforce what is required to be done is how do we ensure yeah. that they have a sense of belongingness to the organization and from a sense of belongingness perspective it is very important because if we look at the retail workforce what happens is that we have huge turnover at that you know it's an industry phenomenon yes you have almost 25 to 30 percent turnover is there so how do we ensure you know some sort of an ownership some sort of a pride in the way that they work so that they have a sense of belongingness and more than that a sense of pride and, and at the end of the day happiness in what they do so i think at the at the factory level i think given the nature of how smiths work etc one of the key things that we try to do is that you know in terms of their welfare in terms of what we do for them in terms of bringing about a sense of belongingness when i say sense of belongingness for them what matters is the kind of accommodation that we provide the food that we provide for them to eat uh, the incentives that we provide and finally at the end of the day you know there are simple things like what is it that we can do for them from a upskilling them and from an engagement perspective so these are some of the key things that we have done for uh, and uh, they come and join yes, in over a period of, yeah but, and then over a period of time they bring others, you know, family members or friends whom they know. That's how it happens. So I think basically the main intent is creating a sense of belongingness for the career. And for them, what matters is, you know, as I said, these are these four or five things which are at the top of the mind. And 
we have to play, I mean, we have to ensure that they are balanced very carefully. And what are those four or five things, as I said, the accommodation, the boarding and lodging that has to be provided for them, the upskilling programs that we provide for them, and at the end of the day, uh, the uh, engagement mechanisms that we, you know, what is it that we look at, you know, since they work together, they stay together, community programs for them, whether it is a simple thing like, you know, organizing some sports for them or taking them on for a lunch or for a movie and ensuring that at the factory where they work, the conditions are conducive, the conditions are safe and, the condi and, and they have a safe and healthy environment to ensure that they're able to do their work because it's, it's absolutely skilled work that they do. And, you know, a small difference can change the design of the, um, what I would say, yeah. the design of the product, you know, and with one stone embedded in a different way can change the design totally. So if, and there are people when they buy, they look, they look so intrinsically at this product, which is of high value, and then only they make a choice. So that's as far as the uh, uh, carriers are concerned. The other, the other major workforce that we have is a retail staff. We have almost 7,000 plus staff out of 1,000 India. 7,000 are at retail sales is, is what they do. So for them to bring about a sense of belongingness, apart from the benefits that we provide, is how they are you know, culturally treated in the showroom and how does the, the showroom head or the store manager behave and create a sense of belongingness. So the word I'm using is how do how are they emotionally connected with the organization? Because you know this is a gen. I mean the age is I mean age is 20 to 25, or even some of them below that who come to work as a you know salesperson. And for them the uh, you know Gen Z thinking is very different. They are willing to take risks, but the, the 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 what matters for them most is how they are treated, the opportunities for them, the ability to get good incentives, and more importantly, I think they look at the cultural fabric of the organization, how they are treated. The freedom that they have in terms of you know their issues their problems how they get sorted so specifically i think one of the key things for this category is good customer service means good reward you know it, it must commensurate with, with 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 good reward for them and that creates a huge sense of happiness because the age group is the age group is the the incentivization of the work that they do and incentivization of the output that they provide has uh, plays a major role as far as their continuity and feeling a sense of pride and sense of belongingness to the organization. So that is how. So the skill set is very different. So if you look at, you know, out of 11,000 staff in India, the uh, the so-called what you would say, the white collar, what you would say, would probably comprise of about 250 to 300. You know, people who sit at uh, the headquarters and uh, the zone heads and the company. regional heads. Yeah. So all put together, if you take all categories, everything put together, not more than 500. The rest, you have a workforce. You know, who are supposed to be the ambassadors of the company and who make a difference with the customer at the showroom, connecting with them, making a difference, giving them that, that superior uh, customer experience. And that can only come about if they have a sense of pride and they have a sense of belongingness with Malabar. And so it's a, it's coupled with, you know, uh, some of the things what we do for the Karigas, training, their accommodation, their food. But more importantly, I think what really matters for this category, unlike uh, the IT industry or unlike many of the other conventional industries which are there i mean one of the key things which you know which which matters in their mind is the incentive uh, incentivization of their output okay but tell me you know when when you when you talk about karigars so how are they different from the uh, see the other uh, workers in the shop floor say in a manufacturing unit you know uh, in a in a way if you look at this is a this is a very skilled shop floor so, worker yeah. that you have you know his yeah. skill cannot be replicated it is not very easy to train you know only this family or their friends you know they have i mean they, they have gotten to this only from a very very uh, young age or, or they've been yeah. trained or they've shadowed somebody that is how this has happened beyond that this really hasn't you know this really hasn't uh, you cannot train a carrier at you know at age 20 i want to become a carrier it takes time you know because to make some intrinsic to get intrinsic work done it happens only over a period of time, over a number of years. That is how it happens. So uh, that is the biggest difference. Whereas, uh, uh, I mean, a graduate who or a or a non-graduate who goes to the shop floor in 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 an automobile uh, uh, in the, in the automobile industry, he or she can be trained for that uh, work. Or a or somebody who takes care of engineering for the aircraft maintenance. Yes, they need some basic understanding of uh, engineering of how you know of 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 the aircraft. But apart from that, a major uh, aspect is they are trained on the product they are trained on here. But for a carrier, oh, yeah. a lot of it is self. Yeah. 
it has to be done it has to be done by them you show them the design and based on the skill that they bring they work and they make that design and and come out with the finished product so you know it it must be you know they might be very vulnerable when you saying you know you highly intensifies them and they are skilled workers so they might be you know a lot of demand for them and they might even switch over just within uh, you know uh, for a few normally, months yeah no normally how it happens is they come they work continuously for about 6 months 8 months since the you know the factory premises and where they live is kind of uh, i mean next to each other so they kind of work yeah. throughout work very hard for maybe 6 months to a year then they go back to the native place for about 4 months or 5 months and then come back again after that so that's the nature of how this industry works and when they go okay. they leave and go and uh, uh, you know they probably bring some others with them some of them decide not to go they work really hard get the incentive and they move on after about one two years but many of them you know work for a long period continuously are happy you know making the product uh, and they get a, they get the satisfaction out of making a very difficult product I mean, jewelry comes in different sizes, shapes, and there are different yeah. kinds of jewelry. There is precious, there is ira, there is diamond, there is you know there is silver, and each design and you know is is very 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 different. So that makes a huge difference in the way um, uh, in the way that uh, they have to give the finished product to the uh, retail, and uh, it's a huge sense of pride that they get when the product that they make uh, gets sold. They have a huge sense of satisfaction. Yes, uh, ultimately, it's gone to a happy customer who spent. probably a huge amount of money to buy that product so uh, you know most of them are gig workers most of them are sorry gig workers yeah yeah see we have like let me explain how the carrier system works one is you have permanent carriers who are on the roles of the company and there are some yeah. who work on a piece rate system so these are the two kinds of this thing there are the on the roles of the company are fewer than the piece rate system because based on yeah. the products that they make they incentivized and they get paid because there is some amount of difference between a permanent uh, um, worker as a carrier and a piece rate uh, carrier so as a, as an hr head of you know uh, you, you this industry also must be new for you this segment oh, also yes, must I, be i i am very much new in this industry after i mean it's refreshing to be in a different industry i have been i mean i have been in healthcare for over a decade and so where well, which was much more organized and which was much more you know structured what 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 kind of challenges do you see you know here in this industry it would be interesting to know you know when you so i think you know one of the key reasons why i took up this opportunity was because there's a whole lot of transformation and i think the yeah. company is growing uh, so rapidly they want to be the world's number one retailer and given that they want to be the world's number one retailer it it requires good processes systems uh, infrastructure employee uh, policies engagement mechanisms uh, cap- uh, capacity and capability building so it's so so the challenges and initiatives are around right from you know right from putting a basic system in place to getting some of the hybrid systems in place and it's a completely unorganized uh, sector yeah. and if you see the players are huge of course the the, the biggest player is tanish but they get the benefit of being yeah. part of the tata group and you know that is yes. there are stand alone groups like malabar we have to work doubly hard to ensure that our systems and processes are far better and we need to have an employer value proposition for employee value proposition sorry the uh, for people to look at joining us as a prospective yeah. employer so that's something uh, there is a there is a lot of work around you know simple things like what can attract people to join us why i mean retail staff as i said the turnover is 25% so somebody who comes in i mean about a year you recruit 200 about uh, about 30 to 50 people leave and we've trained them we've you know we've done all of that but what is key is that how do we ensure that our proposition is strong make people stay with us so what are those hr products and services that we can bring out which can make it attractive for them to stay with us it will take some time but my journey is all about putting that uh, in place and bringing about uh, what i would say uh, sanity to uh, an unorganized uh, system you have got actually you know you have got very two uh, you know you have got employees from two very different spectrums i would say because you know uh, at the carrier level there are people who know only probably know only to do that and would work their entire life on that you know because they have spent years since their childhood because it has been their family business or your or you know the family profession and they you know they learned only to do that you know and at the retail level you know you will have people 
I don't think anybody would aspire to become a retail sales, you know, a, a sales executive or, you know, or study to become a sales executive of a jewelry shop. You know, it must be one of the jobs. So two different spectrums. So how do you, uh, you know, bring the two together? Yeah. Or is it two different, very two different approaches? That yeah, you I have? think there is only a limited uh, amount you can do for Karigas and Smiths because they'll as a family, they'll remain there. What they're looking yeah. at is that the environment, the culture, that is their sense of, uh, you know, that is the their basic sense of pride. Is, is needed, yes. Yeah, basic requirements. And finally, you become a Karigar team leader. Basically, you supervise a set of Karigars under you. So that's the career progression for a Karigar. But hardly a Karigar moves into retail. or That never happens. Okay. Yeah. For retail, the aspiration is to become an assistant store head or a store head. So these young guys who come in. So we've re-looked at yeah. the career path. And earlier, you know, it was something like, I'll take a, a fresh guy who passes out of college, joins as a trainee salesman in the uh, sales executive in the showroom. Took about, yeah. you know, the path was around 18 or 20 years for him to become a showroom head. Now we have re-looked at some of those dimensions, brought in training, brought in engagement mechanisms, brought in, you know, in terms of uh, product leadership training. And as far as... Uh, Team leadership training is what we've brought in. And uh, the option is the brighter ones can have a shortened career path of about 10 years from the earlier 18 or 19 years. So that's a huge, uh, you know, drop from, from 18, 19. You brought it down to 10 for those high potential performers who can look at heading the store. So that's, some, that's an advantage that we have over many of the other competitors in, our, uh, in this industry. Apart from that, we've also re-looked at the profile of the kind of work what people do year on year. So we brought in the concept of team leader. We brought in the concept of <clears throat> uh, different product leadership in terms of in the showroom. So somebody who's been in job rotation, who's been in diamonds will move to gold. From gold, you move to silver. And sometimes you can handle two products, handle two teams. So some sense of excitement. And then we've also uh, ensured that in, when any new showroom opens in that particular city or you know in the nearby city or in that region, yeah. people from this showroom get an opportunity to work in, you know, uh, a bigger showroom like you know okay, showrooms are of different category you have category a b c d e and somebody yeah. from c would definitely like to work in a b or uh, or a category so these are some of the things that we have done and made a difference and specific programs for trainee sales specific programs for management trainees who join and specific trainees for uh, leadership teams what we do so it's been a combination of various things that we've done for them to you know uh, uh, in terms of trying and Trying and ensuring that the longevity with us uh, is, is is more stronger. Okay, so what what is the average tenure of your uh, you know salesperson in a showroom? On an average, you can say anything between two to five years is what they would is, is what five would years, be. Years. See, you know, there's a lot of turnover which happens in the first year, but once they cross the first year, they stay on for three years or so. But otherwise, averagely, average it's about between two to two to five years is what. So generally, what do you see? What is the general mood uh, there? You know, is it there, there is also a lot of trust factor that you have to show on your employees. That see, you're, dealing, somehow, you're dealing with an employee. Who, you're dealing with an employee who has to deal with a huge, like Very for example, the average, yeah, high value stuff. And so, so the element of trust is something that we believe in, and and that is what we propagate our value systems and how they need to will trust up the uh, customer and uh, and by doing some of these things and providing some elements of you know most of these people who work in our showrooms are from other cities like the configuration in most um, other than the category a which are in the major cities you have majority of yeah. people from other cities who come and so it's like in 70 30 or a 60 40 ratio 60 from outside yeah. the city 40 from the city or 70 from outside and 30 from yeah so then it, it's even more the onus of the organization to ensure that sense of belongingness, sense of commitment, sense of pride. So the initiatives that we do on town hall meetings, going and meeting them in their accommodation, the food, engagement mechanisms, all play a big role in their continuity with us and ensuring that, you know, because it's hard work in the showroom, especially during a busy, busy time, which, you know, from 4 yes, onwards, yes. 4 p.m. onwards is when every jewelry showroom is busy, packed with customers. And from 4 p.m. onwards, you know, the num the, and, and the average time that you spend with the customer is about 25 to 30 minutes. And you have to keep repeating the same thing to all the customers that one salesman serves. Like, for example, if you're a gold salesman, you would have met with a family of four, you would have explained to 
the husband would have certain questions, the spouse would have had certain questions, maybe the children would have certain questions. He finishes doing this for 25, 30 minutes and immediately after that, uh, the next customer comes. He may have to repeat. So there's a level of patience, threshold level of patience. And please understand, he's so more than the end the end. Exactly. So, 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 th so there's a lot of hardship involved. And there's also, there's a lot of relationship building which is involved in this. Okay. So how do you break that monotony? There is no way to break that monotony because they're probably that is. Uh, yeah, unfortunately, the showroom job is. Yeah, I mean there are there are uh, breaks that you can take. You can go refresh yourself. There's some. There's a little bit of entertainment provided in the back areas of where the showroom is located, but that's only to a large extent. But more importantly, what we've done is you know lesser time at the store. We've introduced different kind of shift patterns. So one day he may start in the morning, work the whole day. The second day he may start in the afternoon. So those kind of team A, team B, we brought some configuration. So that way we brought in uh, some monotony. Then some staff, when there's a new showroom, he's put in the project team to help uh, as far as setting up a new jewelry store is concerned. And at the same time, we have, uh, uh, we have you know, uh, back end, we have filled the back end with uh, new staff in that particular showroom where he's been there. Okay. That was about Malabar, you know, and and what about, uh, you know, even when you were with the uh, chain of hospitals? Well, yeah. that I think, see, hospitals also is even more difficult because you're dealing with doctors, yeah. you're dealing with nurses, you're dealing with technicians, very, very different uh, skills. Again, very doctors, MBBS, yeah. employees, not MBBS qualified, nurses, BSc, technicians, diploma holders. So I think uh, there we've had to have policies which are very, very segmented to the sections of the workforce. So, you know, basically with doctors, their engagement mechanisms are very different from what we do with nurses. Nurses stay in the hostel. Yeah. So hostel activities, you know, engagement mechanisms, their training, and nurses like to work, you know, the exposure that we can provide to them in terms of their career path, moving from a general ward to an ICU, to a burns unit. So that's the kind of exposure and rotation we are trying to provide. In addition to that, we were also looking at uh, for doctors mechanisms of putting them in charge of a new project, putting them in charge of, uh, you know, uh, more, what I would say, uh, interaction and more relationship building between the support side and the uh, medical side. So, you know, in terms of, you know, meeting with them, understanding what uh, when new technology comes in or when we are, you know, or a new ward is being opened, working with them closely. Uh, but uh, one of the key things is most of the doctors are not on the roles of the company. They're consultants. Uh, yeah. And you know, working with consultants is more around uh, more around what you can do for them. Uh, we started this cooperative society where you know, uh, helping doctors like if you wanted to buy a new car, the hospital would help. Same thing for their family holiday. So so that made a huge difference in consultants' continuity with the hospital, their relationship with uh, you know uh, with uh, the management side. And uh, you know, these are all star doctors. And for them, you know, small small things like cricket match or this, they really doesn't help. So we organize things like, you know, for them and their families, a movie and dinner, which we blocked. Uh, you know, I'm just saying small, small things which we did, which got them a sense of pride uh, with the organization. Then when, you know, when new technologies, new wards are being developed, what is it that we were doing, getting their input. And technology for the doctor, for him, medical technology is very important. You know, the use of, you know, automated systems, the use of, you know, robots, the use of, you know, uh, what is the kind of equipment that you have in the hospital to make their life easier. So that so those were things from the work side which were happening, but on the non-work side it was you know customized you know what I would say uh, with them and their families medical checkups um, you know and inviting them for the annual day allowing them to participate showcasing their talent doctors day uh, so these are all various initiatives that we did to ensure that uh, there was a sense of happiness among them with nurses a whole lot of engagement programs training technicians also the same and. Uh, their ability to participate in joint programs, you know, joint things like that is what we had done uh, uh, on the healthcare side. So I think it's it's about understanding the mindset of a doctor, of a nurse, of a technician, and trying to see how can we make a difference in what they are doing, and 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 add value, saying that you, you know, yes, we are here to you and support you through these initiatives. So that is so that was our thought uh, for the uh, uh, on the healthcare side. Okay. No, no, I'm, I was asking, uh, do you think happiness is very transactional, especially from the sectors that, you know, you have worked for where I, everything is? 
I think uh, you know, certainly is not it's not transactional. I think it's a lot of it depends on who is the leader in that particular area. The leader, you know, in terms of the culture, the cultural fabric, the value system, and how do you engage and emotionally connect with the people who work with you in your team. So that makes all a difference. I mean, it's not about, I mean, it may be a great organization, but, or it may be an absolutely lousy organization with its call, but a good manager makes all the difference. And that good manager can certainly bring about a sense of happiness in his or her team. The traits of that manager, the leadership values, the openness, the transparency, and more than anything else, your humility and how do you get along with all your team members and how do you ensure that, that they all feel connected and you work together as a team. So that depends, a lot of that, you know, depends on the team leader or it depends on the functional head who is heading that, uh, uh, who's heading that particular uh, function. Only then will, will, will the difference be seen. You have worked abroad also. Do you, did you see the nuances of happiness being any different? So suppose if we compare with India and uh, Malaysia, you had spent, you know, quite many years there. So I think uh, you, the biggest difference. Any different? The biggest difference. Yeah, the biggest difference that we have is the fact that uh, things are very much more in a structured environment when you work at an expat. So when you work as an expat, whether I worked in, you know, I worked in uh, Middle East, I also worked on yeah. projects in Africa, I've been, you know, the entire Southeast Asia I've traveled, I know how it is. So things are, you know, in a, in a lot more structured manner over there. And I think work happens, the commitment, you know, in terms of uh, due dates, etc. I think people have, you know, that yes, I have to deliver on this, etc. Uh, definitely the sense of care, warmth happens more in the, uh, happens more in the Indian context. But uh, yeah. uh, I think uh, what really uh, what really needs to happen is the fact that uh, uh, some of those engagement mechanisms will need to probably to be a little more deeper in the you know uh, in some of the other countries because compared to what we do here in India from India whether it's a cricket match whether it is you know outings you know the variety and you know the variables are much more on on the engagement side in uh, in India uh, compared to what you would do either in the Middle East or in uh, or in Southeast Asia. But I think from on the work front, in terms of structure, in terms of the way things are done, I think there is more structure uh, in some of the other, a little more structure in some of the other countries. Okay. Was the interpersonal relationship between colleagues any different between, you know, these I mean, several... It, it all, see, I think those are things, you know, as I go back to the cultural fabric of the organization. But uh, yes, if you ask me, India and abroad, I mean, personally for me, it's been the same. I've had, I have great friends... Uh, uh, in all my okay. uh, international assignments, at the same time in my India assignments also, yeah. But yes, there are culturally, it's always good. Like for example, Southeast Asia, we were, I mean, we used to go play, uh, you know, futsal uh, outings, uh, and we had Japanese, we had a Vietnamese, we had the Chinese. We were all, I mean, together yeah, one team, we going through yeah. all these things, yeah. And even our team building activities, etc., which we did. I mean, there's a combination. So it was, I mean, and and good friends for life that you make uh, in, you know, in some of these um, postings that you had. Uh, uh, international. Do you think it is easier to keep employees, you know, uh, ha happier in an organized sector than in an uh, unorganized sector? The challenges are much more in, in the unorganized sector. The challenges on the work front process system wise much, much more. But to keep employees happy, I think the biggest yeah. thing is your culture, values, and your leadership. If you get that right, the, your foundation is strong. So if you've got a strong foundation, then obviously employees believe that yes, this is the culture because that culture trumps everything else. Your value systems trump everything else. Yes, you may have systems which are completely dilapidated, needs to be worked on, etc. All that can be done if you have the right ingredients of culture and leadership and values in the organization. Okay. Personally, what keeps you, you know, what keeps Jacob happy? So what, what how like does he describe happiness? <laughs> I, I mean, I like challenges. I like trying out new things. I think innovation uh, in HR is something that drives me. Thankfully, I've been able to do that in all my previous organizations. And, and I have had, I mean, immense uh, trust of, you know, both whether it's the bosses or the promoter family that I work with closely. They've given me all the support in trying out new, new things, making mistakes. And that, I think, has had a huge impact on, uh, you know, in, 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 in keeping me, what I would say, uh, Having st have, still having that fire in the belly and trying to make a difference. So I think uh, if you have the complete uh, faith, trust, and support of uh, your superiors, 
and uh, you know the ability for you to drive and make things happen i think that itself is a big motivation and fortunately you know uh, the way in which you work with your teams and the, and and the fact that if they are as energetic and as uh, enthusiastic as you want them to be i think then you can really you know simple people uh, simple people trying to do extraordinary things so would you differentiate between personal happiness and uh, professional happiness or do you think they are interlinked no the traits i think the ingredients is a lot of similarity see it's like you know you got to have both personal happiness and professional happiness to be truly happy i mean it's like saying you know i'm i have some issues on the personal side obviously in some way or other i mean you can never say that it will not i will not bring it to work it will it will not affect me on the work side etc so there has to be a balance otherwise at some time or other it will you know it will you know it's like a pressure cooker at some time or other the steam will come out so that that balance has to be there and the traits are similar you know it goes back to see your value systems cannot differ one value system in the office and one value system in the house it it cannot exist it has to be one i mean it has to be one continuum and that continuum makes all the difference okay generally if you see you know if you see today's uh, generation you know their probably nuances of happiness is very different from you know their predecessors uh, thing how do you think things have changed you know you have worked now you know for more than 25 years uh, yeah or so you, you probably you know started uh, you know in the mid 90s and since now you know how has things changed think, the, uh, the questions of happiness what what changes have you seen in the past i think hours? the depth and rigor and the ability to work in detail on various assignments projects uh, all had a huge impact at the time when i started i think you know bosses were far more detailed uh, bosses gave you the liberty and they had the trust in you and at that point of time you had the ability to work on a variety of uh, you know generalist function but on a variety of assignments now things are becoming more specialized sub specialized and i think people are getting into niche areas so that is happening a lot but whereas uh, you know when we started off uh, even at that time we had a lot of exposure to generalist functions and that and we had to i mean juggle multiple tasks and you know and provide results so i think that gave us the opportunity to really understand look at things in depth and there was a lot more what i would say you know rather than using um, systems there were a lot of things which were done manually in terms of going into depth i mean you were doing data analytics you were doing uh, algorithms even then but yes of course it was done manually so i think the depth and rigor that you got and the learnings you got were much more uh, in today's uh, context there's a lot of technology which has come in but at the same yeah. time uh, how much have are people really learning out of the technology or they just looking out looking at the output i think that that there's a big difference between what happens today and what was happening earlier okay generally you know how do you measure or you know how do you gauge the pulse of you know happiness or the the pulse of mood and among your employees maybe at the karigan level or at the i think see there is a formal system there is an informal system the informal system works much more and when you have when you have strong teams who can understand the pulse on the ground so when you walk around feel when you talk you should be able to get you should be able to understand i'm using the word organizational rhythm and that organizational yeah. rhythm comes from you know water cooler conversations from you know in the cafeteria conversations over there over a cup of coffee or going out for a lunch that's where you actually gauge and get the sense of the organization much more than a formal survey or you know an exit interview or you know or a town hall meeting those are all standard conventional format yes it's there everybody is using it so it makes a big difference yeah. but what really makes a difference is the fact that you need to have informal means and that informal means must you know must give you the right information okay so and and at the karigar level what do what do you uh, generally do you have so a, they are, they are I mean, effectiveness and you know their ultimate motive is you know when they are coming from a different state and you know they they know that we are going to work here for 6 months make money and go you know but still to maintain that productivity to maintain that you know a happy work culture in that setup is it you know something which is very 
hard to get, which is achievable, what it is? No, it, it all depends on the factory manager. The factory manager has to play a key role in the management of carigos. Of course, he has he or she has a support system, but I think the the yeah. the tone and tenor for the factory is set by the factory head. And that factory head, how we train the factory head, our value systems, what we tell, how they behave, makes a huge difference in the happiness index of everyone in the factory. The tenor and leadership shown by the factory head makes all the difference in the happiness index at the factory. The tenor and the tone. You know. Do you think you know problem solving also contributes to happiness? You know, you know, addressing the problem at the you know initial stage or at the you know budding stage that creates a lot of happy environment at the workplace. Oh, definitely. I think you know if problems are left and unresolved, it becomes bigger and bigger, and finally it becomes bigger issues. But if you have uh, uh, what I would say, if you have uh, Problems which are proactively solved, they are heard, you know, carriers are heard, listened to, their issues taken care of. I think there is more trust. How is trust built? One of the ingredients of trust is apart from your cultural fabric and your value system. The other trust is, yeah, if I have an issue, I can trust the organization to take care of this and it is resolved. So that is how trust is built. And the trust end of the day creates, you know, trust is very fluid. Either it's there or it's not there. And through that, it becomes a very, very, uh, you know, uh, it becomes a state which is, you know, uh, which propels employees to do better. So do you have a proper mechanism or a structured mechanism for uh, grievance addressing there? At the yeah, for grievance, redress, for grievance redressal, we have a proper mechanism. But as I said, on the other elements of trust, we've, you know, whatever we've, we've embarked on that journey and we are making a difference. But it takes a long way, you know, in an unconventional sector, sorry, in a sector which is, you know, which has not been used to these kind of things, putting in place some of these mechanisms, it will take some time, but we've, we've at least started the journey on that. Great, Jacob. Uh, that was really wonderful talking to you and thank you for the insights. I hope our, uh, you know, viewers will really enjoy this conversation today and uh, take in something which is really valuable, you know. Sure. Thank you. It's been my pleasure too. And it's been a pleasure to uh, e-meet you. Thank you for the opportunity and look forward to interact with you more. And, uh, you know, thankfully, uh, it's been a great uh, initiative. I mean, it's been a great learning from my end too. Thank you. Thanks, Thank you. Jacob.